So in 2014, Harvard Business yeah. Review wrote a cover story that was titled, Why Can't China Innovate? <laughs> and five years later, we're sitting here, just down the road, and of course, I think hopefully between the two of us, we've made a pretty strong case that can, China certainly not only can, but is innovating and innovating right. relentlessly. Right. What did they miss? Uh, <laughs> it's all about timing. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, and speaking about timing, uh, Silicon Dragon, when my first book came out in 2008, it was ahead of its time and nobody believed that. And so I think that there was a lot of carryover from that. There's no way that China can innovate. Uh, it's just ridiculous to think that they can and there's no examples of it. And so, but you really have to be there yeah. to see it happening. You have to have a grassroots perspective and, and, and go to the market. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we should know with the number of Chinese that come over here to get educated at great institutions and come out of our R&D labs and spend time with some of our startups, that certainly they're bringing the know-how back home with them, absolutely. Yeah. So one of the things that you know we've talked about before, right, um, not only is, is there a unified national policy, right. not only is there a massive amount of venture capital, there's a work ethic that is quite extraordinary. So there's this right. 996 culture, right? Mm -hmm. 996, nine hours a day, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., yeah. 12, six days a week, which you said is really more like 10, 10, 7 it culture. Is. <laughs> and Michael Moritz, the legendary uh, managing partner of Sequoia, excoriated U.S. startups as being too lazy. But yet I know that there have been some Chinese entrepreneurs that have tried to resist this. How, is there a, a chance of a backlash when people are working 13, 14 hours a day, seven days a week. I mean, what, how does that play out over the long term? Because we're all human and, and we're all driven, but there's a point where the, the body breaks down. How does that work itself out? I think some of them, are, they just feed off of that. Yeah. They feed off that whole entrepreneurial energy. And mm -hmm. when you're caught up in it, it's hard to, it's hard to think about anything else. And uh, look, I'll, I'll confess to uh, being right there with them in, yeah, in some sure. cases. It, you know, in China too, if you don't, if you don't just uh, give it everything you have, yeah. you're you're going to be left behind. Yeah. Okay. You will you will be uh, the next person. Yeah will come up there and say, well, I'll do it then. You know, I'll, I'll beat you to that. I will beat you to that, and they will beat you to it very fast. Yeah, okay. So China, it, that's not the case in Silicon Valley, I don't think. Yeah. Silicon Valley, you have the luxury. You can have weekends. You can go out sailing or go out hiking on the weekends, but in China, you don't see that very often. And Jack Ma is a big proponent of this whole 996 entrepreneurial culture. Right. He's helping to make it a mainstream uh, idea in China. Interesting, and, and obviously the country has followed suit. Yes. So there's no doubt that the, the, the number of U.S. companies that have succeeded in China, you can, you can literally count on one hand, right? I mean, it's been very, very difficult for the U.S. to compete there. Now, the Chinese have struggled outside of China, right? And obviously they that have. Wall Street Journal article yeah. about Alibaba struggling in Vietnam. Why do you think there's been such a challenge? I know that Xiaomi has had some success. Huawei, of course, is a huge exception to the rule. They've been dominant, right? And if it wasn't for legislative actions and right. sanctions, they would be in pretty much every country in the world. But if we push right. aside Huawei, why has China struggled outside of the mainland? Well, it is interesting in that, um, and I don't think it's really widely um, uh, known that China has really not been that, su that yeah. successful in going global right. until now. Yeah. And now we're starting to see this open up so that you see a company like, uh, or a, a mobile app like TikTok go global. Yeah. Uh, right. But other companies, uh, Baidu um, has never really ventured out of China except for Japan, and they yeah. failed in Japan. Yeah. They failed in Japan. Alibaba is going, taking its model by buying into Southeast Asian companies, but they're not doing that here in the U.S. They are not acquiring and investing in e-commerce companies here in the U.S. because we already have our dominant one. Yeah. We have Amazon. Right. But even though I would argue that Alibaba is more advanced than Amazon is in e-retailing and in some of the ideas that they have on, on delivery, uh, I would say that uh, Alibaba is not going to be foolish enough to come in here and try to compete with 
uh, Amazon. Yeah, okay. I think the splinter net phrase is a great one, so I, I share your enthusiasm, and I wanna, I wanna kind of do a deep dive on that on a couple of issues, right? So there's no question, right, and, and we're here in Boston, and although, you know, and we're on the MIT campus, we're in Kendall Square, the, the world's largest, most successful biotech cluster. And there's been a massive reduction in the amount of capital flowing into the, this economy. So there's definitely been a lot of people that have been affected directly by a lack of Chinese money coming into the biotech sector here in Boston. Um, one of the things that I've seen personally, I'd like to get your perspective, but I spend a quite a bit of time in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And just as the Chinese VC community seems to be pivoting to Southeast Asia, right. You know, it's hard to miss the number of Chinese delegations visiting Israeli venture capital firms or doing their tours of, of Tel Aviv and the startup nation ecosystem. Right. To the point where, you know, I have trouble finding an English language newspaper at Ben Gurion Airport, but I can find five, <laughs> you know, um, uh, yeah. Mandarin language. Yeah. Newspaper. So what's happening there and how do you reconcile the pivot to Southeast Asia as well as the pivot to yeah. Israel as well? Well, Israel loves China capital. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, sure. They need it. They need it. And Israel needs the China market. Yeah. So it's a perfect marriage. Yeah. And China loves their technology as well, right? I mean, uh, world class right. technology. Yeah, so a number yeah. of the venture funds have capital from China. Okay. And a number of the Israeli companies are moving into China. And, and it's very interesting that Technion a leading technology university yeah. set up in China. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, makes sense though, right? It makes sense. Yeah. So now the star market is new, right? Just since July, yeah. um, and obviously it's another part of the made in China and yeah. keeping capital close to home. Um, you know, the the original companies that were floated on it were probably not China's best ambassadors, and I know there's been some challenges there. But what do you see that turning into over time? It's another splinter net type of activity, you think? It's just Chinese companies will go public, you know, tech companies will go public in, in uh, China on star market and the rest of the world will go public on, on I NASDAQ? I think the quality companies, yeah. uh, they want to go to NASDAQ and okay. NYSE. It's a trophy. Yeah, okay. It's still a badge of honor. Yeah. And I don't see the star market replacing it okay. anytime soon. Okay, so it's a, it's a baby step. But as the Chinese have proven, they, they're willing to take many baby steps to get yeah. to where they want to go. So 50 years from now, Maybe 50 it, could, years be, from it now. could be NASDAQ, but today well, we it's... But we can ask Hearst yeah. about what he thinks of the impact of And I'd love to get his perspective when market. you have him up here. Yeah. Yeah. So here Hong Kong, of course, has is, is been an interesting uh, place, right? Yeah. It's, Hong Kong's been... And I'll, I'll just close with one or two last questions. Hong Kong, obviously a lot of unrest. Um, a very interesting um, attempt for the... Uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange to acquire the London Stock Exchange in quite a rebuke, right? Which was, we don't know if Hong Kong will continue to be the sort of the, the center of the yeah. Asian yeah. financial capital yeah. markets. Yeah. And I realize you don't have a crystal ball, but it's a pretty tense situation there. Um, what, what do you think is the likely outcome? Because it's been, for it's Hong been going Kong? on. Yeah, for Hong Kong. Because it's been going on now for 15 weeks, right? And it seems to be getting more and more polarized with you know, Chinese students turning their backs on the flag and stepping on the flag at soccer games and doing some things that are just so, if you try to do that on mainland China, it would not end well. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it, it doesn't, at this point, doesn't seem like it's gonna end very well. Yeah. Um, and I'm getting emails from people who are in Hong Kong right now saying it's very sad, you know, the MTR stations are trashed and, uh, yeah. you know, they can't go to work and yeah. they feel like they're unsafe going out in the streets. And, uh, you know, I thought it would actually die down with the start of school again, yeah. but it hasn't. No. And uh, because I saw that hope happen before with the umbrella movement, it just kind of faded away. Right. But, yeah. but now it's definitely there with much more uh, vigor. Absolutely. And uh, I don't think, um, I, I, yeah, this is really something that's very troublesome. Okay, yeah. my very last question. This was a remarkable thing for the, the CEO and founder of Huawei to do, right? Yeah. To offer their extraordinarily advanced IP, everything, patents and know-how and all that, right. to a Western company to assuage the fears of Trump and his administration. Um, uh, remarkable, I mean, almost un unheard of. How, <clears throat> do you think someone will likely take advantage of that? No. No, I don't think so. But I, you know, look, I, I have had uh, uh, 
as a journalist, yes. you know, um, I get uh, pitch stories all the time, right? Yes. And so I have to say that Huawei has a very effective corporate communications department. Yeah. And this is, a, I think, it's a very effective yeah. PR ploy, whether yeah. anybody takes it or not. Yeah, I agree. It's yes. very effective. You know, we look, it caught everyone's attention. Absolutely. It got big press. Yeah. Oh, they're going to concede. Well, Huawei's going to uh, concede. They're going to, you know, give us something. Yeah. But I really, I think this whole China tech ambition is unstoppable. Yeah. It, it's, it's, they're not going anywhere fast. And I think you made yeah. that point. Yeah, yeah. They're not going anywhere yeah, any yeah, fast. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a real wake up call for the U.S. We need to pay attention to this. Yeah. Um, and finally, this story has gone mainstream. Yeah. And the timing for our event was uh, impeccable. So listen, yeah. it's a pleasure Thank having you, you here Mike. in Boston and MIT. Thank you. Thank you. I wish you the best with the book. And I'm going to uh, invite Hearst up now to take my seat and, and join Rebecca in a discussion, please. Okay? Cool. Thank you.